I'm Anne Rundle-Teeley and I lead a team of 40 social marketers who are based in Brisbane, Australia. Um, many years ago, I took this foolish decision to actually step into a world where maybe I could actually contribute my skills in a way that maybe we could help, in a way, to make the world a better place. So my PhD and my professional background is marketing. And that PhD that I studied was how can I sell more wine to more people more often. <laughs> I spent years learning my craft, and I have to say I might have been very good at what I was actually doing. I graduated from my PhD from Foster's in Australia, a very well-known brand worldwide, heard a little bit about my research, and they actually asked, could I please fund your work? And perhaps you could just you know, focus that work you now do on beer. So I went, well, sure, that's not a problem, and started to actually, again, proceed on this merry path of how can I get more people to drink more beer more often. And of course, the beauty of doing any research in alcohol is everybody loves alcohol, particularly in Australia, just like Ireland. They're happy to talk about it, and it's not too hard to actually get them on a roll. At the same time, I was actually teaching Management 101, and I actually set my students a, a, literally an essay. And in that essay, I asked these students to actually write to me about corporate social responsibility and set that in the context of obesity. And at that moment, as I was reading and intersecting between using taxpayer funds, so yes, I'm a university researcher, to teach big corporates how to sell more, I was reading these essays and for the first time I sat there and a little light bulb sort of like went off. And that light bulb was the realisation that some children grow up in homes where they know no better. They haven't grown up in the advantaged world that I was fortunate to have. And yes, I did have a few bad years, young mum standing there in social security lines. And I credit that now with who I am and how we came to be. Because those years spent in lines, as I was a little bit disowned from my family at the time, taught me everything I know. I am a very humble human being. And I understand that every person is an expert of their own existence. And who are we to tell someone that they're a problem? You see, some of how that comes to be is a result of everything that we have all done. So a lot of my work in Australia now really centres on starting to disrupt the very way that we actually operate. And I was delighted when Christine asked me to join here and to speak between Al, Walter and Jared, who actually taught me one hell of a lot about social marketing to help me come up to speed. And I switched across to this world to actually figure out how we can actually push on now and do what we do. So that team pictured up there, there are some of them out in Australia today, down in a, a very low socioeconomic suburb in Melbourne, Victoria, doing graphic health warning evaluations as Big Tobacco continues to fight to perhaps point out that these warnings that we have don't work. I have others up in fields doing sugarcane farming practice change projects because a lot of people actually think that the growers have got it all wrong. I've sat in governments where people point their fingers at these growers and you would think that these growers just stand there pouring chemicals onto their farms for the hell of it. And that is not the case at all. They're experts. They've actually grown in farming through a lifetime of experience and they actually know what they're doing. What they challenge are a lot of very sensible things. Are the application rates that industry set realistic? Do they really need that much? What do we really know from the science between the soil types, rainfall, about what is actually coming off farm and why? And some of the scientists don't currently have the answers. So I think it's on all of us to become a little bit more humble and to stop thinking that we know best. Yes, we're charged. We're given a responsibility because we actually understand there are serious problems and they're costing our society. But rather than actually viewing the world as a problem, what we actually need to do is think about finding solutions. So let's work together and see what we can actually do. So when Christine sets, and I have to say Healthy Island, a theme for this event and this meeting on co-creation, I think you've nailed it because that is what change actually takes. So let's just have a bit of a light moment before we kick in and have a look at a good social marketing execution. Or not. It was working beautifully there for a minute.
Tina assured me it would work. Once more. <laughs> That was me. What is it with computers? <laughs> I have one question. Remember the title for this talk, Social Marketing is so much more than communications. What else was featured in that clip other than great, fun, engaging communication? A lot of faces looking up at me. The condom. Actually distributed, given out, because safe sex requires maybe that you actually put that on. How about we then create a very engaging campaign where we don't even have to talk necessarily about safe sex practice, but potentially we can actually engage people simply by making it a whole lot more fun. So I think that for us is a really important reminder about what marketing actually is. Now remember, I was trained as a marketer. I was trained to watch, to observe, to listen and learn. Walter correctly said this morning that we draw from psychology. But we also drew from economics. How can I use the very little that I have to get the very most with what I have? So there is a really big imperative behind my thinking that goes far beyond these two disciplines. There's a bit of anthropology, sociology, all sorts of other things, as we realise it is incredibly complex to affect any form of social change. Now, when I switched from commercial across to social, very, very crazy move. I moved from selling something that was faster, shinier, prettier, to something that people don't want to do. Get up off your couch, get outside. You've heard I come from Australia. I live in a place called Brisbane. This weather that you're experiencing here today is my winter. It gets really hot. 
So let's get people up off the couch who are already overweight. Let's get them walking because they would love to do that, wouldn't they? That is a very, very hard sell. And so what I realised as I walked into this space that it actually create, it really does require a whole lot more creativity and a lot more distinction to really jump and stand out from the crowd. On top of that, I always have less. More so, I also have governments that come and go, which means the funding comes and goes. One government goes out, chops that one off. I've got a new idea, let's start again. And what I see are multiple brands that pop up over time and we smash away the very assets that we've started to build. We also get this proliferation of non-profits, all competing against each other, all with similar messages, all trying to target the same group. Moreover, the way we actually tackle some of these problems, as we like to call them, is actually very siloed. So let's look at an individual. Let's look at their health. But have we actually considered their health in light of their unemployment and where they live? Have we actually put the whole intersection of some of these issues together? And the answer is no. We're operating across the planet in very, very siloed thinking. So I'll get engaged by one department. Can we look at traffic congestion? But then I'm getting engaged by another. Can we look at obesity? Now, does it not make sense to bring those two things together? Because if we all got out of the car and we all actually walked this morning like the boys did, we'd all be in a better place, wouldn't we? So we've got a lot of work to do. So my talk is a little bit more practical. I'm going to share just a couple of the things that we worked on last year in 2017 to demonstrate to you the process of how a social marketer thinks and how they hit the market with something that people want to affect change. My examples featured here are very individual focused. And Walter this morning has very rightly said that we need to do far more than just target individuals. But my first campaign has a very clear problem. We actually can't go upstream and we can't prevent food waste yet because the council is actually in a contract that runs for another 2.5 years. 23% of all waste in their bins is food waste. So whilst it would be nice to run upstream and put all sorts of environmental changes into play, we can't. We've got 2.5 years left to run. So what do we do in the meantime to start to move that needle of food waste back? I'm going to let my chefs and the people running the campaign speak first for me. The Waste Not Want Not program, or our little campaign here, started uh, with Council's um, waste recycling and reduction strategy. You know, for a person that advocates um, full cycle cooking, I think it's very important that we always use everything like, you know, like people say, nose to tail cooking. We always basically try to use um, a lot of things um, to reduce food waste as much as possible. I approached Griffith University, marketing at Griffith, to see how we could partner and collaborate and work together uh, to develop a program and a campaign for food waste reduction. Trying to show um, everyday shoppers and everyday home cooks how to um, utilise produce they have in their fridge at home without um, with less wastage. So recipes and examples and techniques which avoid things going to the bin or over, over producing things that are not necessarily eaten on a day-to-day -day basis. It's very important in today's age, uh, sustainability. And sustainability goes from the bottom to the top, from reducing the product to not wasting it. Food waste is a resource that currently goes to landfill. About 23% of um, our community's curbside bins is food waste. The, the cost of groceries will go down with the purpose of sustainability and the, the weekly spend. The, le the less that goes in the bin, there's more they're utilising, the less wastage is not just food, it's money as well. We'll give you about five minutes to render your decision. Now, of course, I'm a marketer and you see the, the Griffith University marketing at the end of it. How did we do this campaign? We were charged with actually needing to engage householders to actually understand how we could motivate them to reduce food waste. 
And the one thing we actually understand so quickly as we embark on this journey is that everybody loves food and no one really likes waste. So the globally run campaign, which has remarkably little effectiveness data reported in any form of peer reviewed literature, Love Food, Hate Waste, was one of the many options that we took into co-creation sessions to warm up people and actually understand from them what it is they would actually like. We ran a systematic literature review first to actually look right across the planet to see what had been used effectively to prevent food waste. Two very clear campaign ideas came out of co-creation sessions run with more than 50 residents from that local council area. One was a small bucket that could be put in the kitchen. Again, remember, Brisbane's a bit hot because like food waste gets a bit smelly. So keep it with a nice lid on that's really tight. And they could then take that bucket outside to their bigger bin, which council can't do yet. And they could then just pop the scraps straight into that. If they lived in an apartment, that bin would be located in the apartment block. So great idea for 2.5 years time. The other idea that actually came up, again, predicated on love, food, hate, waste, was a very simple consumer insight moment. A lot of people don't like food waste. And a lot of people cook their, recipe, cook their food from pre-prepared recipes. They go out to the shops, they buy something, make up that recipe, and in doing so, get some leftover food that goes into their fridge. And it's once they've got this leftover food in their fridge that they are a little bit unsure. What do I do with the combination of things left in my fridge? That insight taught us everything. We don't know how to recombine what's in our fridge. So Waste Not, Want Not was born. We worked with those three chefs and we actually came up with recipes after surveying more than 300 different households and asking them to take pictures of the food in their fridge. We asked them what they waste the most. What do you waste the most? Lettuce. That is actually the same answer that we had down under. Exact same answer. Fruit and veg was the most wasted category, followed by bakery and then meat. So just for the starting of this campaign, remembering it was a pilot, we actually undertook to focus on just one area, fruit and veg. Now, a good marketer focuses on one thing in one campaign and then serially rolls on, increasing and bringing in more and more over time. So that's why we just start with that one area of food. Our chefs were given that list of ingredients, so everybody had things like lettuce and carrots and onions in their fridge, and you can see some of those featured on the options here. We'd also ask people what they normally do with some of their leftovers. And whilst some of the recipes actually match that, others don't. They really start to build in that element of surprise. We take those recipes and we go into a shopping centre and we engage the target audience. Now, if you're a marketer and you want to sell food, the single best way to do it is to offer food samples. People love free things and they love things that taste really good and they certainly love them when they're warm and cooked fresh. So we actually ran food demonstrations, and you can see that top picture there, with one of our chefs who was paid, and pretty much most of our budget really was her, and she was actually demonstrating how easy and simple these recipes could actually be. So in doing this whole campaign, we also learned there's a healthy eating campaign here too. Cauliflower-based pizza is loved by two-year-olds. Mums would come back and ask if they could have a second piece. They then took the recipes because little Johnny was now eating a whole heap of vegetables that he actually doesn't like. So we had a whole lot of fun doing more than just engaging the community to talk about food waste. Now this was a partnered program. We can't do this on our own. I needed chefs to tell me the recipes that we could actually take forward. We needed the retail space and we needed ovens. So at least four grey hairs here are from the ovens because they actually needed two-phase power and that was just one of those little things that we didn't think about in campaign design. So I love the joys of delivering something in social marketing. In two weeks in this local council area, just two weeks if you remember this, we gave away 10,000 recipe cards, we gave away 5,000 food samples, our, our media, not one cent spent, not one, reached more than a half a million people. And this happened just before a national 
Australian, so our version of BBC, but ABC, started an actual program called War on Waste. And when I watched that program, it too had some excellent elements to it. So people very happy to engage with our student volunteers who would open up a fridge, talk about food waste, and they would have a conversation around what would you do with what's left in this fridge. The other partner that benefited enormously from partnering with us and being bold enough and daring to let our team of students and novices in, the Cleveland Stockland Shopping Centre, got a 15% increase in foot traffic. We actually built a program that people came back to. Some people came in every single day to watch what Dominique actually had to offer. So a lot of fun to be had. Now, like Walter said, measuring your outcomes is key. And we're not here to have a party and just talk to people and raise lots and lots of awareness. We're actually here to deliver outcomes. And we had two. The first outcome, could we increase self-efficacy? So people's skills around how to reuse the leftovers in their fridge. And the graph that you see there shows a clear result of increasing self-efficacy in the 100 households who were selected and given a program pack. We ran a control, so these were households that did not see us in the shopping centre and did not get a pack, and you can see a much flatter line for them. But really importantly for us, we also asked people pre and post to report how much fruit and veg they threw away. And we had a 41% change in a reduction of fruit and veg reporting for the households that had been exposed. So you can target individuals and you can affect behavioural change. Now, for those of you that aren't fully aware of social marketing and, and what it actually is, years ago as I stepped across into this space and then had to start educating people in Australia that I'm a lot more than Facebook and I'm a lot more than communications, we started to embark on a bit of an exercise to clearly demonstrate where the fundamentals, and these aren't a perfect list, but they are at least a good starting list. And we actually started to prepare a whole series of reviews. So here you have got our version at the moment of what we see some of the key criteria as actually being. And one of my earliest students that I worked with, Julia Cairns, who does all of her work in the food environment space, she hardly targets individuals, she just changes environments to deliver better eating choice. She starts off with a systematic review to clearly look at understanding what had been used where. She went on in that review to demonstrate a very interesting point. If you do more than just communicate, behavioural change is more likely. And this started to underpin our very work. Now, we're the first to admit you can't always achieve all of those principles. That food waste ca campaign I just demonstrated to you had no segmentation and was lacking a theory base. So it lacked two of the actual eight that are recommended. So I am the first to stand in front of all, all of you and say doing more is better, but you don't necessarily always hit the full end game. It is awesome if you can. A subsequent PhD student who has just completed and is currently in examination undertook a very large trial across in Finland in a school setting. <coughs> he had three groups, a control, these schools got nothing, just the love of two surveys. He had another group who got communications. Let's put up lots of pretty shiny posters, what Alan affectionately calls splat. And then a third group who actually got more than just communications. And Ville's work very clearly demonstrates that you get four times more behavioural change if you put something real and something people can transact or engage with into a classroom. He had kids in lines tasting food. He had kids doing cooking schools to prepare fruit and vegetables. He had supermarkets supporting the campaign, offering discounts on the featured fruit and veg. So very coordinated, partnered program to drive parents and their kids out to buy more food. By driving them out with a real offering, he actually got way more behavioural change. So I, I maintain, if you can achieve more of these, you will do better. So over the years, we have been continuing as we enter and embark into a different space to produce these systematic reviews and just simply count presence of clear reporting. So it doesn't mean that they might not have it across a whole range of areas, from eating 
to use in social and digital media, to physical activity, focusing on kids, to alcohol, to physical activity on seniors, because guess what, they're a little bit different. Adults, again, different things working on different cohorts. And this is marketing, we know this. We know one thing doesn't fit everybody. We've been off in the space of littering and of course, tobacco. So these are all examples that are available. You can email me and I will happily send you a paper at any point in time. And every single one of these papers has a really clear scorecard. Which paper has used which benchmark where? And then typically, we've got a really small couple of sentence description, so you can kind of just go to, and it gives you an example of how that particular principle is evident. So it's our way of helping to give back. Can we start to teach the community how to start to embed more of the way marketers think into the activities and the processes that you use? Now, just to maintain a point here, we don't always target individuals. We know that we can do things with the environment to affect behavioural change. So for those of you that speak German, you will understand this. What I will do is play it because it does speak for itself and then I will quickly speak again afterwards. Whoops. Too efficient. St. Pauli is the party viertel in Hamburg. And for über 20 million besucht. That one's not playing. Okay, St. Pauli in Hamburg and this video is well worth a look, actually sprayed walls because men love to urinate publicly. And St. Pauli is a big party spot in Hamburg. Now, partly that is a lack of available resources outside. But what they actually came up with was a paint. And they actually sprayed the walls such that if the man stood and peed, it came back and splashed onto them. So you can actually do something in marketing without having to tell people what to do. And I am a bit of a fan of that approach because I hate to tell someone what to do. How many of you like being told what to do? How many of you have got kids? And how successful were you at telling your two-year-old what to do? So given we can't just tell people and they just do it, I've been very fascinated about our love for running straight for policy. Because no matter how much policy we write, unless we can enforce it every single time, it's not going to affect change on its own. So it is part of a behavioural change mix, but we can't think for a minute that we put a menu list up and tell our canteens at a school what to stock, that that is then going to be rolled out, unless we've actually thought through about what alternatives can they now access at the same price point and have you got data and evidence to teach them very clearly that they can now roll this out easily, cost effectively, and get the same outcomes? So social marketing is pretty complex. We've got to really understand the scenario that we're operating within. Julia Cairns' work and work that we're just finalising right up now evaluated two very recent changes in an eating hall. If we provided a pizza option where people could actually step away from the standard offering, we moved 30% of the market. Everybody loves pizza. But you can actually do it for healthy eating too. The lunch option was actually a grab and go bag. It was nutritionally balanced. It was made to be very simple. And we moved 19% of the market across to a healthy option. So I love that study for its elegance because yep, if it tastes better and it's fast food and it's a little bit more, we can move even more people, but we can still move people to the healthy option too. So remember our process. It is a very simple one and it is a cycle. A marketer never stops listening. A marketer does not set a plan, put it out and wait for the outcome 12 months later. A marketer immediately responds to any form of feedback and moves. So whilst we write plans, Frankly, the very best plans fail. My training taught me only one in 10 ideas will succeed. So I was actually trained to fail. And I know a lot of you haven't been. I know a lot of your funders won't tolerate failure. So how do we step around that? It's called trials and pilots 
and agility. We have to learn to move really fast. So the way we see social marketing is really quite simple. Get into a market and learn. You need to co-create a solution that stakeholders are going to let you put into market, build it, and then engage the community or whoever you are actually trying to reach. You do that and then you start again. So this second campaign clearly shows where each and every one of social marketing's foundations has actually been applied. And the best part is, as I was flying up on my 22 hours of time, and we get Wi-Fi now in airplanes, it's awesome, I was actually writing the next round of the marketing communications for this campaign because it's now going into citywide rollout. So it's a good example to show. We can also move from pilot, delivering something communities want. How many of you have heard of a koala? Excellent. Anyone hugged one? No? Yeah, Patricia? Excellent. They do have really big claws. And all of us actually look at these beautiful creatures, kind of like imagine them like teddy bears, but they're actually not. Don't pick one up. It's not a really good idea. But we were actually charged by a local council because koala bears are under threat. And so no matter who I'm speaking to or how, we have to be very clear that if we don't all do something, we won't have these creatures in Australia anymore. And I'm the first to think that maybe we should fight for one of our fairy ambassadors. But being a social marketer, a little bit naive, I had no concept of just how politically charged this exact issue is. A koala is threatened by three things. One is when we reduce its habitat. We demolish trees so that we can build because we need progress and economic and property development and that's the number one cause of fatality to a koala. The next are the cars that we drive. We can actually run them over on our roads because they come down from a tree, walk across the road to get to the other side and go up the tree. And the third way a koala dies are our fairy friends, dogs. So our component and the thing we were asked to pilot is can we help reduce dog attacks on koalas? Now that is a big challenge. So we walked in and we started applying all of social marketing's benchmarks to actually see if we could understand how we could work with dog owners to prevent koala attacks. And here's the process that we used. A very clear one where you can see the little hexagons on the side demonstrating which social benchmarks are present as we start this whole process. So to actually step into market, it took five months of research to actually figure out how we were going to step forward. So pretty rigorous approach. Our typical approach is let's do a systematic review because surely someone's done it before and we can actually speed up and do it faster and learn from them. Well, no study on dog and koala prevention initiatives existed in the literature at all. So we widened the search slightly. We have a very fast review team and we went for how about all forms of wildlife and domestic pets. We got a very short number of studies and realised we really have nothing here. So for the first time, we actually engaged right across the experts involved in this whole issue. We spoke to dog trainers. They taught us, if you want to change a dog's behaviour, you have to change the owner. And you need to get that owner in four times. We spoke to koala experts, incredibly passionate people, who are very good at getting about 80 or 90% of the community to switch right off. They are so passionate that no one else actually wants to listen to them. So that's a slight problem, but they teach us a lot and they also help us enormously in terms of what we do. So those two things, the systematic review and speaking to experts, find and uncover for us other things that had been used previously to try and raise awareness for koala issues or tried to target dog owners to achieve change. We also went out to community to survey. A, we needed a baseline for the behaviours, but really, we actually needed to understand community attitudes. How willing is a dog owner to tie their dog up at night, because that's when the koala is most at risk, comes down, gets stuck inside a fence, pretty much fair game if the dog's off leash. So pretty sad stuff. So, 
Are they willing to confine the dog or tired up at night? And how willing are they to train the dog? And what were the dog's current abilities? Now, the survey was brilliant. And talking again to those dog ex experts, awesome. I learned a lot, uh, a lot more than I would care to admit, having also owned a dog. But a dog needs to sit before it can stay. It needs to stay before it's actually going to be able to be follow a command, leave it. So we knew we had a bit of work cut out for us to progress our owners through stages. And we only had nine months. Remember, four of these lost, getting all of the research side organised. So a big job. All of that understanding comes together and is taken into the co-design sessions. Now for us, co-design looks a bit like a focus group if you've seen those, but it actually doesn't involve us other than us moderating at all. It's all about you being formed into a group. You're a team. You now have to come up with a shared understanding of what would work for your team. I then get all of these teams, so my 60 people together, to look at what they would actually say. So our systematic literature review uncovered a whole 16 studies. We had reviewed thousands of papers to essentially find out there's not a lot out there and there is nothing targeting the owners. All of the studies were scientific ones that were all about devices. So if I stick a collar on a cat, do I reduce bird deaths? So it kind of had nothing out there that we could work from. We utilised our experts, as I said, and that uncovered all sorts of wonderful initiatives, from community event days to dog trainers who could actually teach animals how to run away from a koala. It's called koala aversion. If you rub scat, which is koala poo, onto the koala, that scent is used to train the dog to either find it or leave it, which is why our campaign name comes to be. We use a very common theory in social marketing. Doesn't mean it's the right one, but this was a planned behaviour. We took the theory of planned behaviour, and that demonstrated quite clearly to us that change most of these constructs, and you should be able to change intentions, which theoretically should go on to actually change behaviour. So just show, showcasing how theory is applied first to actually gain some understanding. And then that theory is actually used to start to underpin the communications and everything that we do. So we know we need to change norms. We need to change the attitudes of the community so that they actually appreciate what other people think and what other dogs can actually do. We take all of that data, throw it into a multivariate, complex, messy analysis that no one ever understands, and we get four clear segments. One of those segments becomes the one, so if you remember before, marketing is very economic in its thinking. We only had this much time, so we chased one segment because it was the largest and it was the most attitudinally predisposed to actually change. You see, we only had this much time to try and demonstrate, potentially, what social marketing might be able to do. We actually took all of that information into our co-design sessions, and our owners came up with excellent insights to teach us what to do. Now, you might think that dog and koala attacks are pretty rare, that they don't happen frequently. One of our owners in the co-design session reported that her dog had killed a koala. So we knew we had nailed the right people that had been through an experience that no one would actually want. But she was happy to declare it and very open about it because this was all about what can we all do to try and prevent this. But the community of dog owners were really clear. Do not stigmatise us. Do not make us feel bad that we own a dog because it's council driven, it's council run and frankly, council has the biggest role to play. They are taking down trees. So here I was left with very clear charge from my community that I represent that this program is not to be about koalas. Please extend the focus. Our dogs chase other things too, from lizards to birds. They land them, they kill them. So why don't we make it more wildlife focused? But importantly, could we have a program that's fun? And could you teach us what we actually need to do? because some of us might not actually know. So that insight drove the way we actually took this whole campaign forward 
And it also demonstrated the intricacy of social marketing and how difficult it is to get what is now a very clear, easy idea out to market. It is bloody hard. I was in Washington for the World Social Marketing Conference, fielding a conversation with the mayor at 2 a.m. Washington time because she wanted to put koalas into the press release for our event. I refused. I said, if you choose to put that into that press release, we can't go forward. Our dog owners were really clear. This is not about koalas. And to me, our job is to represent their views. Our job is to attempt to hold a line. So what did we do? We'd listened to our dog experts. Can we offer four weeks of training? Can that training be adapted to the level of the dog? So from advanced to intermediate, to the starter, to the puppy. So we offered all sorts of different things. And I'm a marketer. I have a real problem with the way we actually focus on delivering programs in community. We love to give them away. We talk about how people in need can't afford it. We talk about all sorts of ideals. Yet what are we doing every time we take a decision to not put a price on something? How do you feel about something that's given to you for free? Is it the highest value in your mind? No. And so this drove the thinking of, can we offer a service at a price that people would actually want? So we came in at a price just slightly below what standard dog trainers would offer and running a competition to ensure anyone could still access this program. So that's how we overcame the fact that some people would counteract in council that no other people need to value this too. We trained our dog trainers. We employed Steve. He came up from New South Wales, not my home state. And Steve trained our trainers. We deliberately asked the trainers, well, we didn't really say much at all. Like we asked Steve to train them. They were trained on how to get the dogs to avoid koalas. But we didn't tell our trainers this is what they had to embed into their, tra their training. The program was never meant to be koala focused. So we were hoping by just seeding the behavior that we might then get an effect that started to roll through. And that's what we were trialing. So we delivered these programs at different locations and allowed the community to actually opt in freely and buy these sessions. Now we were told in those community co-creation groups that dog owners wanted something fun. So we created Dog Fest. Let's have an event where all dog owners can come together and celebrate their furry friends. We'd never run a community event before. Council told us, post-program, they never thought that this would happen. Can you imagine a team of PhD students and a professor who walk out of a meeting and we've got four weeks to make a very large community event happen? I looked at my team, I said, I've never run one before, I have no idea what we're doing, and we went for it. We got 2,000 people to come to Dogfest. We had 21 retailers offering hilarious things from dog beer to puppuccinos, ice creams, treats, and so many more things. We had a lot of fun. We learned a lot about the variety of things that are actually out there. The event had a serious side. All of our trainers were featured doing talks, demonstrations, and they had stalls. All of our pre-event marketing involved us being out in community, and I had the pleasure of watching a lot of people I'd spoken to bring their problem dog, and then I could point them to one of the trainers involved in Leave It. Again, we didn't push trainers to sell Leave It. We had our own tent there. We were just happy to push dogs into training, knowing that was an awesome outcome for all involved. So a lot of fun was had with an event that effectively engaged so many members of community. My favourite photograph that features on the actual report for council is a dog owner with his German Shepherd sitting up here. And if anyone has a German Shepherd, they're a really big dog. They're watching that demonstration that you can see up there. And the way I actually look at that photo is the owner thinking, Fido, that's what you need to do. You need to sit just like that. So, so much fun had just watching and observing owners interacting, having fun and coming along. So the other aspect that they actually had was just the fun of sharing. And if you can see the photographs here, the weird costumes, the fun things that dog owners actually love to do with their furry friends. 
So I feel like we hit the target audience, engaging them to get awareness for this program and push it out there. We moved forward and actually went onto the program, and I won't belabor this too much here, but we used the REAIM framework. We looked at reach. We looked at understanding how far, how wide, not only for the community, but our partners. Would they be involved again? What worked well for them? What actually didn't? Pleasingly, 92% of retailers said they would come back. 86% of dog owners said they would do Leave It again. Now that indicates they would come back to subsequent training offerings. We thought that was a, a really good feat. But again, like all programs, this one had a really serious side. We were actually charged with trying to engage dog owners to go to dog training so that we could actually have dogs trained to not chase down koalas. I got the pleasure of watching a few of those training sessions to learn how a dog trainer might be teaching koala aversion. One put the koala teddy rubbed in scat up a tree and the dogs present there were taught not to go near that tree. So they would visibly walk away from the actual tree. Another trainer put a koala on a skateboard and then went running across the room and the little koala's like skating across. Again, the dogs didn't chase that koala. So it's not exactly real, but you would also probably appreciate maybe using the real koala for training purposes is just not acceptable. So a lot of really fun iterations watching how the trainers actually took something that we did not necessarily tell them to do so here's the marketing moment. You can achieve so much, you don't need to tell people what to do. Support them, listen to them, enable them, and they will go on to put something into place. So that was some of the key. Remember too that I said I didn't necessarily expect to actually have koala aversion embedded in puppy training and like early beginner training, but it was. And our dogs actually could demonstrate change right across a range of behaviours, including koala aversion. So as a team, we were pretty happy. This graph shows two of our participant dogs. Momo was the competition winner, so she had a free program, actually chooses to come along, and actually benefits from participating. So fun to compare her to Leo, a paid customer, and just again demonstrating how much progress these owners could actually make in just four sessions. So behavioural change, and if you apply marketing thinking to affect that change, can actually deliver something that both community wants, that council has now decided to go and re-support. So we're now charged with going citywide and having a much bigger party than perhaps the last one that we actually had. So thank you very much from my perspective for coming along, making all of the effort to actually come here. One of my biggest motivations is to help try and get more people to understand that social marketing is so much more than just communications. Socialmarketingforchange.com is just a free description of our early work before we hit this three-step process. You'll see a fourth one in it. We're currently building a massive online free open access course. So if you want that, go to our website, register. The day it's alive, it's there, you can use it, and you can freely share it. Because our motivation is that if more people start to bring more marketing into their change efforts, they will more effectively engage community. And community wants good things. What they don't want is to be told what they need to do. And some people do not need to be informed at all. So if your early research, any formative work, shows that people already know for heaven's sakes, stop educating them. They know it already. They're not doing it. And that's the hardest part, I think, for a lot of people in the change space to understand. You are all very highly motivated individuals. I can just about guarantee that most of the time, if I tell you you probably could think about moderating or doing this, a lot of you are just going to move and do it. But you can't assume the rest of the market's like that. It's not on their radar. It's not important. So engage them in a way that works for them. Importantly with the dog owners, give them something fun. 10% of dog owners in that council came to an event that had four weeks of marketing. And again, not $1 spent to get them there. So the key is to work with and co-create 
as a solution that's going to deliver the outcome that you actually need. A couple of resources that we've built to explain what is the hardest of the social marketing benchmarks, segmentation, and the many ways that a marketer is actually going to approach research. We don't use self-reports. It's what you do that actually tells me the most. So wherever possible, my team will be out watching, listening, and learning. They won't be asking people what they actually think. So thank you so much for your attention. Any questions?